um, Dr. Daniel Shanahan, uh, Assistant Super for Funded Programs, uh, Executive Director Bobbin Gandhi, he's our Technology and Information Management System. You didn't think I knew that, right, Bobbin? Behind him is Dr. Ogechi Waha. She's our Assistant Super for Curriculum Instruction. Ms. Dominique Maribel, our, one of our Directors of Special Ed. Mr. Tom Carton, our Director of Safety. Need that, you need that, right? <laughs> and we have Taryn Washington-Peterson, one of our principals from Pomona. Sheila Luna, she's one of our everything, our, our family uh, community engagement coordinators, which is super important nowadays, especially coming out of the pandemic. And Ms. Natalie Espinel over there again, um, I said that twice because she's in charge of business, all right? So we're just here today, I'm glad you came out. You kind of, if, you, if, you know, if you're here, you know the history of East Rampo Central School District and the challenges that we face with passing a budget. Um, so the way, this, the, way our, the way our budget goes, it's, it's, it's three, three, three uh, sources of, of funding. Federal money, that goes to all students, whether they're public school or private school. So if a child starts in public school, transfers to private school, that federal money follows them. Now then there's state money that goes only mainly to public school students, unless it's commingled for transportation. And then you have the local community tax, you know, from property taxes. So that's what we're really here for. So we start all of our meetings off with, uh, we share our, our mission, our vision statement. As a unified community, the East Rampo Central School District is committed to educating the whole child by providing a healthy, safe, supportive, engaging, and challenging learning environment. Our vision will be proficient in all that we do. We have five goals and three commitments. And everybody here that went through school, I'm sure you understand how important it is to have success in the early years, lower grade foundation. Early childhood is, is like, people think kindergarten teachers have it easy and pre-K, no they don't. It's the toughest job because you, you teach them the most at that point. We want to develop healthy, safe, supportive, engaged, and challenging students. We want our students to be motivated, confident, empowered, critical thinkers. By the time they leave us in high school, we want them to have a mastery of academic subjects in the arts. And then when they leave our charge, when they graduate high school, we want to make sure that they're ready for college, career, and beyond. So our commitments are to academics instruction, social emotional learning, guidance, social work support, um, all of the things that really became super important after the pandemic. Because um, we're, we're communal beings. We're not supposed to be isolated. And during a pandemic, can you just imagine being locked away as a teenager for a year and a half like everybody was during a pandemic? I don't know if I would have survived. I love my family, but I don't know if I would have made it. And then we have operations. So that's finance, um, operations, um, facilities, uh, and you name it. So our, our purpose for tonight is to kind of bring the, the community together so we can re understand what our challenges are and how we can make an a, a opportunity for our children to continue because all of you benefited from education. All of you went through school. You know how important it is or you wouldn't be here. It, whether you go to college or not, there are skills that you get in school that you can't get otherwise. Academically, yes, but interpersonally and getting along with others. So we'll share with some reminders and we'll also take uh, questions uh, for our conversation. So um, these are our district commitments. Again, academics, social emotional learning, and operations. So under academics, we have research, we use research-based teacher, teacher professional development. Uh, we focus mainly on literacy. Of course, you need, you need literacy uh, to, to do well in any subject area. Um, we, we, really, we have a high focus on our English language learners. Out of our 10,400 public school students, close to 6,000 are English language learners. They're new to the country and they, they're trying to, we're trying to provide them academic language. Um, we, we, we focus on print and digital resources. You know, our, our children have to be comfortable in both uh, mediums. When we were coming up, we normally would take paper and pencil tests, paper and pen tests. Um, there's a new iteration of exams that are commu called community-based testing CBTs. So our, the same tests we took, similar, but they'll take them on computers. Now, also, we want students to have access to accelerated courses. Some of our students are in College Now programs. They, they, go to, they spend part of their day in our high school, and they spend part of their day in um, Rockland Community College and other colleges. Of course, we, we believe that a well-rounded student um, is, is super important. So academics, the arts, um, fine arts, athletics, all that is super important. In terms of social-emotional learning, we focus on restorative, envi restorative environments. We teach children, um, we don't just punish, because discipline means, doesn't just mean to punish, discipline means to teach, right? Because like, I used to get my little share, 
I'm from a Caribbean background, so you know I got my little beatings when I was little. <laughs> I almost got, if I only got one beating a day, my father was proud of me. He would come home from work, how many beatings did you get today? So the, the, the point is, if I learned not to get, do it again, that was more important than, you know, you don't want to just keep disciplining your child like that, right? So the other piece is, how are we going to build up a community where they, they feel secure in school, they, they get the counseling, our, our counselors are here, our social workers, and built-in mentoring, especially through our sports programs, our teacher-student relationships and the like. Now, operations is big, and that's one of the main reasons we're here tonight. We have a huge amount of capital projects. We're spending um, close to 90 million on some facilities upgrades based on some federal money we received in 2021. Um, that money is gonna sunset in September, so we have to spend it all by then. Whatever we don't spend, we have to give back. And we're not trying to give back a red cent. Next, uh, we're looking at providing new gym floors for our high schools and our middle schools. Um, we have certain other equipments we have to uh, upgrade, and especially in Ramapo High School, we wanna add some ramps so they could be ADA compliant. That means American Disabilities Act, so any of our community members or our children that are um, disabled in any way that may need you know, wheelchairs or what have you, they'll have ramps and they'll have access to those parts of the buildings. Good old. So, academics, I'm gonna call up my assistant superintendent, Dr. Kenshi Waha, curriculum instruction. All right, so good evening, everyone. I think that we're talking about a school district, so we're, we're talking about educating children, right? So we, we know, and I think it's made, been made very public that we have challenges, real challenges. And the point and the purpose of schooling is to provide children with a sound education. And a sound education looks different for different groups of students. Our demographics are the composition of our district has changed, so we need to adjust. But it's very challenging to adjust if we don't have stability with finances. And the instability is causing a challenge. So we really, really need to improve our instruction, our academics, through putting in the right structures, infrastructure, the right people, the right programming. What we have here is a th the theme for this year. Um, with support from our federal and state government, um, we wanted to make sure we pulled our resources and focused on literacy. So we named this year, what is it, team? Leaning, leaning into literacy, all right? So we're leaning into literacy because we know all the new research on the science of reading. We know the national data around what our teachers and leaders are learning about how to teach children to read. Right? And that's really important in terms of our population. Is everyone with me? Okay, so we wanted to just highlight some of the observations this year because we've already told you last year what we would be doing this year, so I wanted to just let you know some of the, the consistencies we saw this year. Um, we did a, a literacy study that has, um, is completed at this point, and we just reviewed it today. <laughs> so we updated this today uh, with the observations from the study. The, so the study, went, we went into classrooms to observe what was happening in literacy. We had focused interviews with teachers. We did surveys to see what is happening K-12 so we can kind of make, this not kind of, so we can make decisions about what we need to change and what we don't know, because we have to confront what we don't know and actually build. Um, so what we noticed, these were some things, some highlights and observations from the study. Uh, we, they did see us that we were focusing on reading and language acquisition in all subjects, that we had targeted small group instruction, that we addressed needs. I don't know why I'm tired. I feel like I'm, I'm like racing. <laughs> but, um, that we were addressing the needs of English language learners, that we did focus on K2 phonics instruction. We, there are some things we need to do differently there. Um, and that there was um, an emphasis on direct explicit instruction, like at, seeing the I do, we do, you do, to sort of gradually release our students. Um, so those are the highlights. There are some takeaways that we need to look at and prioritize to make better. And we need a budget to do that. 
So the next two slides, we wanted to show you um, some growth data. This is not performance data. Performance data is, you know, meeting um, a specific point value, you know, like how many percent, how, the percent of students meeting proficiency. This is different because we know where, that our students right now in terms of performance are not where we want to be. So we want to see, we want to work on the growth. How, how much are they growing? So that's what we thought we would focus today on. So in, we, we, we give, um, we give two, well, we're focusing on two assessments, the reading and the math here. We give it in the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and towards the end of the year, like this time around March. So this is comparing the growth from when we first got it, gave it in the beginning of the year to the third time we gave it, which was about March. You with me so far? All right. So then when you look up here, there's green, excuse me, there's red, light green, and dark green. So low growth is like, mm, they're not really growing the way they should from the first to the third. The middle with the light green, it's saying, you know, they're growing typically. What typically should happen? What we really want is this high growth. We want to see more of that. That's atypical. That's like they're growing more than a year's worth. We need that to be able to close the gap so that we can actually see the improvement, see the movement in the performance data. Does that make sense? Okay. So you have, we have to work on progress and growing so we can see those um, points move on students meeting the state expectations. So what we're seeing here is that we are, we're doing better than we did last year. We're having more growth, K-12, atypical growth in reading. Okay. And we're hoping that as students are taking the assessments, this week was the ELA assessments, grades three through eight, we are looking forward to see what that gives us in terms of all the work that the teachers and the buildings have been doing. For mathematics, same thing. We're seeing that there, there's more typical and atypical growth than there is, you know, low growth. So that's a, that's a good thing. The reason I, I, I want to just put a caveat, because we're seeing the growth that we want, I just want to make sure we understand it's going to take time for us to see um, some, some for, depending on the grade level. It's going to take, it's going to, we, it's probably going to take some time before we see the double, triple growth, the triple performance that we're expecting, but we, sh we're looking for more high growth and then we can close the gap. Any questions on this? Okay. So then what have we been doing? It's like an if then, if we do these things, then we're hoping to see the growth. We're hoping to see the, uh, our students meeting the standards. We're hoping to see um, improvement in general. So the if is that if we do these things, we work with several partners. partners. Um, one major is Generation Ready, helping with our buildings. One of our building principals is here. We actually just had conversation about the great work that's happening in Pomona with our instructional rounds. Teachers are coming together as community of practice. Um, we are working with PNW BOCES. Uh, we, Hill for Literacy did the uh, needs assessment study that we spoke about. Um, we have multi-tiered instruction. We're working with a variety. This, the last couple of years, we're working with a variety of, of organizations to help in different areas and to give us data so we can make decisions, especially now that we know that the ARPA funding is coming to a close. We have to be really, 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 really um, targeted in how we use our money moving forward. All right. Um, at this time, I would bring up you want me to continue? Oh, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, d any questions on what was said thus far? Curiosities, it's okay if you, any questions, any clarifications? All right. Okay, so in terms of social emotional learning, um, in, we, we're writing some data here. School clinicians, we have around 29 school psychologists, 12 social workers. Um, just remember, we have 14 buildings. Okay. Eight family resource coordinators, some of them are out there who greeted you. Um, 21 school counselors. We try and keep to, a, as best we can, to 1 to 250 ratio in our, high school, in our secondary schools. One counselor to 250, we try our best. It's a, a little challenging. But with a strong budget, 
we can increase that support. Um, homeless liaison, we have a FACE. FACE stands for Family and Community Engagement Coordinator. And our focus, uh, one, of, one of our foci, especially coming out of the pandemic, you know, because something happened during the pandemic and attendance. And um, I believe there's uh, news that I've seen like New York Times articles, other articles about, you know, just attendance in general and chronic absenteeism. What we're, we are proud of is that we have had a decrease in chronic absenteeism, meaning students are coming to school more consistently. So we wanted to show that data. Something we're very proud of as well is our food pantry. We have food to give our families who need it. We have a family welcome center that is very welcoming. Um, it's, I mean, you can come down to central office. It's open. It's welcome for you to see it. There's um, services being provided. We have um, classes for our families, um, and we're very proud of that, the workshops and also health clinic. We want to continue doing this. We want to be a community and make sure that everyone feels safe and supported as we strive to you know, improve the district as a whole. And operations? One of the, a great job, Dr. Waha. One of the things I would add, uh, especially about the food pantry, we've fed over 5,000 families so far. And um, you know, I encourage you, you know, it, it doesn't, anybody is welcome if they need. So that, that's our commitment to the community. And we work really hard to get that in place. So that's one of the things we're really proud of. Um, one of our um, community members, she's on one of my, my community superintendent circles here, Ms. Carol Anderson. Hey, Carol. And um, Ms. Davis is on my community circle as well. One of the things Carol constantly speaks about is, is really us getting positive press out about our district. We are a punching bag, especially for Low Hut. And I'm saying it on YouTube so everybody knows. I know what you're up to, Low Hut, and I don't like it. Don't do it because there are children's lives involved, and we have children going to school every day. We don't want them to feel like they're going to an inferior setting. That's not the case. We do, do we have struggles? Sure we do. Everybody does. Every district does. But you don't hear it blown up in the newspaper all the time. So I, I just wanted to get that off my chest. So the, we do these town halls so you can hear directly from us all the positive things that we do as well. And it's all verifiable as well. So in terms of operations, like I said, we, uh, we received a, a large sum of federal money in 2021, we received something called um, the American Rescue Plan Act money, ARPA funding of $149 million. We also received COVID relief funding um, of close to $60 million more million. But I could also give you a lesson on how to spend that money in 10 minutes. <laughs> over, over 200 million we spent really quickly. So in terms of the ARPA funding, the 149 million, we committed 90 million to facilities upgrades. Our buildings really need a lot of work over the years. So that'll be closing out September where that work will be complete. Uh, we also use uh, around 30 million for learning loss during the pandemic from, you know, not, some children can, th can thrive by virtual learning on computers, but some need direct contact just like we're doing now. And then we have social emotional supports um, that we use as well. We use money for social emotional learning. We have planned projects that we want to complete this year. So the ones we completed were the gym floors, school floors, Kitchen hoods doesn't sound like much, you know, like that little hood over your, your, your stove, except when you have industrial sized kitchens, it's a big deal, right? So that was, we were taking a beating about that for a while as well. Um, fencing, um, and we got Lakeshore furniture. We replaced basically all the furniture for grades K through eight for our students. Uh, the plan projects for this year, we are looking at doors, hardware, window replacement, uh, ADA improvements, that's the American Disabilities Act, again, uh, providing appropriate ramps and access for people that have um, dis disabilities, right? Um, and we're going to replace not the piping, but the water fountains, and we're putting in lead filters as well, because there was a, a big, big uh, building survey, a building condition survey we do every five years, all districts have to comply. And they found out in around 2016 that there were issues with lead in the water. It's not lead in the water. It's because at that time when these buildings were built, and I'm sure you all own homes, you know, at the time when these buildings were built, that was just the kind of the quality of materials they used. Um, even, even where I live in Long Island, in my house, 
I still just let my, my faucet run for a minute before I use it because it build, it, there's buildup of, of, of materials and chemicals in the, in the piping. So it's always good to let the water run. That's a good little hint, public service announcement I just gave to everybody. And um, we're going to improve bathrooms. We're looking at um, our casework. Uh, secondary gymnasium floors we'll be replacing. So that means the high school, the gym floors in Spring Valley, Rampo High School, and our middle schools as well. And we're going to do some, some, again, some ADA work and renovations in Rampo High School's auditorium, add, add more ramp, ramping. So <clears throat> next, when we, we set up a framework when we make our decisions about budgeting, um, it's always that question, is it good for kids? Right? So some people think that just because we have a lot of students, we just view the kids like cattle. They're just like, you know, just a bunch of kids. We know that you may have one child at home, and that's the most important thing in your life. So we treat all 10,409 of us, so I think it's 10,409, that's what it was yesterday. 10,409, yep, as if they're gold. Because we want them to go home in, in as the same or better condition that they arrived in the morning. The worst kind of news you can provide a parent is that it's an accident, something happened to the kid. We never want that to happen. So safety is first, and order precedes learning. So we want to prioritize our students and student learning and their safety. We want to remain aligned to our strategic academic plan. That's the work we do with New York State Education Department. Our mission, our vision, our priorities. We want to maintain equitable access for quality education for all students. So when students enter our district, if they need English language services, they receive it. If they need counseling and social work, they receive it. If they need special education or related services, they receive it. Because that's, that's the law. It's called the FAPE law, Free and Appropriate Public Education, F-A-P-E. And that is what we, we stand by. <clears throat> we want to prioritize equity, diversity, inclusion in our discussions and our way of doing business. So we want all of our children to, um, first of all, be comfortable with everyone else and be accepting of differences. You see, this is a very diverse community. And I grew up in a very diverse community as well, in Park Slope in Brooklyn. One of the benefits of a very diverse community is that children become better problem solvers. They're accepting of differences. And whether they've been around people with special needs or not, believe it or not, there's research that says they are way more accepting of children that have special needs and people with special needs, just being in a diverse setting. But it's a gift and it could be a curse. Because when people come together from different backgrounds, it could be amazing. But sometimes it's easy to just run back in your corner and say, I'm just going to stick with my own. And sometimes in this district, that's what's happening. We're trying to break that. We're trying to break that wall down and, and, and kind of build, rebuild a bridge between the public school community parents and the private school community parents. I don't think it's an overt kind of issue, but it does boil down to the proof is in the pudding. If we can't pass a budget, that shows that the community's not coming together. It's not just to get, give more money to the schools. Of course, if we pass the budget this year, we were looking for a 1.99% increase. It'll be around $3 million. I'm not sneezing that away as, as if it's nothing. But $3 million to us and our families is a lot, but $3 million to 10,400 students and 2,000 staff and 32,000 non-public school students, we could spend that right away. But it'll, 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 it'll be the first step. What do they say? The journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, right? Because we could keep saying it's the state's fault, it's the politician's fault, it's everybody's fault. But all we have to do is take care of our own. We don't have to beg anybody for anything. It's all the powers right here in this community. So let me just get off my soapbox, but I really believe that. And next, we want to we make sure that we protect East Rampo's strengths and long-term viability to be financially solvent. So. I'm going to be introducing my assistant superintendent for business soon, Ms. Ms. Espinel. Her, she and her team did a great job. They made sure our bills are paid on time. We save money. We never miss a deadline. None of my team members miss a deadline. So if you, it, like, when you want to build up your personal credit, you save your money. You pay your bills on time, right? Um, you're never late with things. And your credit goes up. That doesn't happen in a school district or a big organization with a large budget. So we have, for, for personal credit, it's Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, right? Everybody, everybody knows that, right? 
but in large organizations, our credit is determined by Moody's rating service. So even though we saved millions of dollars, we pay all our bills on time. We never miss a payment, we're never late. Our credit ratings in Moody's kept going get lower and lower and lower. That's because the local share, the school tax hasn't been above a zero in years. I know there are community members that says it's passed a couple of times over the last 10 years, Carol. Some people say that, but it's passed at zero. So we pass at zero because it, people say, well, what's the difference between a failed budget at zero and a pass budget at zero? If you fail your budget at zero, um, let's just say for facilities, you can only take care of emergencies. But if you have a long-term need, like you, we knew the gym floors were in bad shape for years. If it's a failed budget, we can't fix the long-term need. If a roof comes in for an emergency, yes. If it's a failed budget, I can only give changes in salary to unionized staff. You know, teachers, principals, what have you. Non-unionized staff, the assistant superintendents, executive directors, directors, they can't get any kind of raises or incentives unless it's a, a successful budget, whether it's zero or not. So I just want to explain that, because people feel, well, what's the difference? It's a big difference. When you fail your budget at zero, the simplest transactions become Herculean. Like, something simple becomes very difficult. So I just want to, if you look at the bottom, and again, right here, we, want to, we must comply with federal and state mandates. That goes without saying. We're never going to exceed our budget. We're never going to spend more than we have. Because when you spend more than you have, you get yourself in trouble, just like you know, in our budgets at home. And we have to fulfill our contractual obligations for our t contracts with staff, contracts with vendors, transportation, purchases, what have you. But if, I just want you to look at the, the bottom part of the screen, the beige part, looks beige to me. I'm colorblind, I think. So we have 5,884 English language learners out of our 10,409 students. We have 1,368 students with disabilities. Um, we have 1,547 students that are considered homeless. I like to use the term students in temporary housing. Um, that's, that's more palatable and there's new guidelines because years ago, students in temporary housing were considered like families that live in family havens or family shelters, right? But since when the first, um, not the first, but one of the economic crashes in 2008, after that they redefined it. Because uh, when you become doubled up as well, that's considered somebody in temporary housing. You know, like when, fam like when my mom came to this country, they would have considered us students in temporary housing because she, her, her cousin sponsored her she came in from St. Vincent. We lived with them for a while. And then, you know, then when she got her papers right, we did that for others, you know? You see? So that, that's part of it. And so we, we do get some funding for that. And one of my team members, Dr. Shanahan, does a great job handling that. We have 1,679 students that are considered black, African American, Caribbean American, and we have 8,142 students that are Hispanic. We have another 578 students that are a mix of, of, of close to 40 other ethnicities. And then we also serve actually close to 32,000 private school students. We provide transportation for them. We provide related services, so that's special education, occupational, ther occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech. So any child, whether they're public or private, that lives in our district that have a special need, our obligation and the law states that we will give them what they need. We will provide the service. If we can't provide that service in our district, we will transport them to a school that can provide those services. And um, next slide. So now part of the budget decision making framework is that, again, keep this question in mind, is it good for kids? In spite of all the challenges we've had financially, we have not cut any um, student facing programs. Anything academic, we have not cut anything in terms of fine arts, athletics, and it would have been easy to do that because those are very expensive. But I also know that, just a personal experience, if it wasn't for sports, I wouldn't have got out of high school, right? I wouldn't have even had an incentive to go to high school because I dropped out of high school for a year. And it was athletics that got me back in school. So it's a value. Things we don't think are important, it could be music, it could be acting, it could be what all the clubs, right? That child, that could be the thing that motivates that child to come to school. Because if a kid is bright in English, language, arts, and math, they can get that in any school. But if they come to school for the other things, like their friends, the way their staff, the teachers treat them, 
right? The way, the way they feel when they, they feel better coming to school. And it's not just being with their friends, being with the right kind of friends. And one of the best things we can all teach our, our children is how to pick friends. Picking friends well, picking friends wisely. Um, so next, we wanna make sure that as we develop this budget for next year, we maintain and we hire all the needed classroom teachers. We've been, we, we pretty much register close to around 200 extra students every week. I mean, we have students that exit our district, but we're constantly enrolling new students. And every time there's a new student, we have to have a teacher and a classroom to place them in. Now, we're running out of space as well. So we may have to come up with some alternatives like, you know, pushing teachers in a room. It's because it's about student-teacher ratio, right? So we don't want our, our classes to get beyond like 25 kids a class. I believe in small class sizes. But if you don't have the space, you gotta think creatively to get around it. So um, there's another way to do it. We may not have the space, but I could put two teachers in a room with 30 kids, and it's 15 kids to one staff. So that's the way we have to do things like that to be creative. So next, we wanna, we, we go back, we wanted to make sure we kept our art and music program. I really wanted to stress that. Um, art and music is big. You know, the, our marching band is, is, has a lot of notoriety. I brought them up to Albany one year at the Black and Latino Caucus, and forget it, they turned it out, right? People are still bragging about that. We wanna keep our athletic programs. We've said how important that is. Our social emotional supports, our social workers, our family coordinators. Um, we, we have to hire some more transportation employees because we serve close to 40, 42,000 kids daily, go, going and coming. So, you know, I know there's been accidents, we've heard of stuff like that. But when you think about the number, the sheer number of children that we transport every day, I think overall, we're, do, we're doing quite well. Can we do better? Yes. But we need more staff, and that's one of the things we're going to drive at when we get to this point about, you know, um, taking care of this budget. Right? Next, next slide. So I'm going to bring up um, Ms. Espinel. Is this, the, is this the slide, Dominique? Keep going? OK, they told me keep going. So here, <laughs> so I love this stool. We, we created this stool a few years ago. So it just talks about the three streams of funding that provides resources to a school district. It's pretty simple. We have federal funding, again, that goes to every student. Every student in the United States gets federal funding. Every student in New York State gets federal funding. So I'll give you an example. First kindergarten and first grade, I went to, to public school, right, in Brooklyn. I remember one day, I don't know, I, my school was a block away from my house, which is terrible when you live that close to your school. Your teachers can get to your parents too quickly. So anyway, my teacher tells my mom that I was back talking. I was in first grade. I was not back talking. I was asking a question. But back then, you couldn't even ask a question, you know? So anyway, besides getting my butt torn up, she said, oh, you want to be a bad John, eh? Next day, I was in Catholic school. And you know what that meant, right? Because the nuns could tighten you up in Catholic school. So, but the money, the federal money that I, that I was slated for, if, if I was slated for it, because it goes by uh, uh, financial need, would follow me from public to private. Private school, though, they don't get too much state funding because that's for a public school. Now, they do access some benefit from state funding in terms of when that money's commingled for transportation, right? And then there's the local funding that's for based on the property taxes. That's what we're really driving for. And that's why, even though we had a great amount of savings the last two years, we were never late with our bills, none of that. That's why our, our Moody's credit rating kept declining because they say, look, the community has to, put, has to care and add more and support what's going on in terms of the budget. There is, the community does pay a property tax, but like with anything else, I remember when I got my first apartment, I was 19, I could get a slice of pizza and a can of Pepsi for $1.50. You can't, you can't get that. Uh, slice is like $4. That's why I love pizza to this day, because when I was broke, I always had a meal. A can of soda is like $2, $3 now. So everything, no matter, no matter how simple it is, all expenses increase over time. There was a time when I could put $20 and fill up my tank. $20 is a quarter tank. Right? So it's just, it just shows what, what inflation has done. So that's part of why we need the property tax increase. We also had a computation where 
Ms. Espino and her team figured out, let's just say your, your property is worth, say, $700,000, right? Your, your property tax increase would be around $137 a year. It turns out to be roughly, if my math was been correct, please correct me, but it's around 38 cents a day. It's less, you know, when you go home and empty your pockets out, less than that. So that's why we have to, we have to try different ways for people to realize that we, it's going to be $3 million, but it's not $3 million from any one person. We're all sharing the cost, and we all benefit from it. All of you here benefit from going to school. All of you went to school. All of you are productive members of society because you are educated. And that's a fact. Anyway. Federal funding is like Title I. That's for financial need. Um, Daniel, Title II is that PD offer instruction. That's professional development. Title III is part, called Part 154. That's for English language learners. And Title IV is an instructional infusion of funding. Correct, right, Daniel? So those go with all students, whether they're public or private. Normally, when we show this image, the leg that says local is broken. And, it, and you know, if the school leg is broken, what happens is you're going to fall over eventually. So what happens is, where we are now is, by not passing above a zero budget for all these years, it's almost like if you have a job, and say you make, say $1,000 a month, right? And your bill's are around $950 a month. You use a rest for whatever, travel, food, I don't know how you're gonna live on $50 in food. These are bad numbers, but you get my point. And then, eventually what's gonna happen, if things aren't perfect, you're gonna have to start using your credit card. Right? Or you're gonna have to dip into your savings. And then what happens is you're in a hole. Because now your credit card bills are going up. So so what happens is when you when you don't pass the budget, it's like your 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 expenses are outpacing your revenue. And that's why we all live within a budget. So everything that you do for yourself at home to maintain your budget, we do as well. Um, just on a just on a larger scale. So that's, that's part of the challenge. The part of the challenge is the state has helped us over several years, but you know what they say, people will help those who help themselves. And we have what it takes to help ourselves in this community. Next slide. So this is gonna be a breakdown of the expenditures. So again, a lot of it is reiterative because we wanna want to drive home the point of what our main focus is is instruction for our children. The main way to dispel inequities there's no there's no data better than when students are doing well. That that's a silencer. It shuts everybody. It shuts up all the critics, right? So the largest portion of our money goes towards teacher salaries, classroom instruction, classroom resources, curriculum development. Then operations, costs for transportation, maintenance, utilities, and every day-to-day -day school operations. Even little things like accidents. Last year we had somebody, they brought their child, their teenage child in one of the schoolyards to teach them how to drive. Kid ran, lost control. No, it wasn't a kid, it was the uncle. He was supposed to be teaching his nephew how to drive. The uncle lost control and crashed into one of our doorways, so we had to fix that. So we have unexpected expenses too, right? I was, gonna, I was getting ready to blame the innocent child. It was not, it was the uncle. It was his fault. So anyway, Transportation, we put that first. We have universal transportation in this district. Um, most of us, when we grew up, you would receive transportation if you lived a certain distance from school. You know, a mile and a half, two miles, depends on where you grew up, but you, you, get, you get my point, right? But in this district, in the late 80s, the community got together. As you know, a lot of the neighborhood does not have sidewalks. Children actually, people walk in the street in the morning and you know, it's crazy. And at that time, I guess there was an uptick in accidents and stuff like that. The community got together and said, you know, um, let's, let's do something that'll benefit the safety of all our kids. Let's do universal busing. So there's no mileage limit. You could live two blocks from school and get a bus if you need it. At the time, late 80s, there was around 9,000 public school students and there were around 6,000 combined private school students. So at 15,000 students, wasn't too bad. Everybody was safe. Hooray, right? Those 6,000 private school students are now 32,000. The public school went up around 1,400 students over that time. 
but the private schools went up 26,000, and we transport all of them. Um, the year before I arrived, I think they spent 40 million on transportation. The second year, the first year I was full year, I was here, it was 50 plus, right? This year we're finishing up, Natalie, it's 62, 63 million. Next year is projected to be $76 million. So that's why we need the community, the community support in this regard. It's a lot of money for transportation. I'm not saying it's, it's not worth it, but I'm saying we're, we're hanging on by a thread now. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. Now, administration funding's allocated for district leadership, my district team, human resources, our personnel department, and other central office functions. You see? Next slide. So here, we have, I shared about our, our revenues. We talked about the tax levy, that's the local share. Um, the proposed budget, uh, revenue budget, that's what Ms. Espel and her team has developed. She'll be going over that momentarily. And the, the, the revenue considerations. And we also have to look at our, our proposed budget, our expenditure budget, how are we gonna spend money? You know, um, even when a district is in good shape, there's gonna be a time when we have to borrow money, right? Um, we have a lot of reserves, we saved a lot of money, but that money is, is not to be playing around with. So for instance, when you, when you get your property tax bill, it's usually in November you have to make a payment, in April, right? And your general tax is January and July, right? But in school tax, the first payment after school year is in around roughly November, right? That's when, you know, when, as soon as you pay it, they send it out, it gets to the schools, right? Um, but the money, the flow of money doesn't, after August, there's, a, there's a, a gap in the flow of funding until the school tax money is infused. So that's when we have to make a short-term loan to you know, make sure we maintain our obligations, like payroll and the like. Those are the reasons you need reserves. Although we have reserves and we're gonna, need, we're gonna use them to balance our budget, it's not wise. It's never wise to dip into your savings, especially if you know there's a need for it. So, we're going to talk about the expenditure uh, budget, expenditure considerations, and budget efficiencies, like how we can spend our money more wisely. And then we'll, she'll also go over what a contingency budget is. That's if the 1.99% does not pass, right? If it fails, it's a contingency, but there's also a way to pass the budget at zero. Initially, we went out at a 5.378 budget. We knew. We knew that wasn't going to pass, but we needed to share with the board and the community how high the stakes were. Even with a 5%, 5.3% budget increase, we still would have had to dip into our reserves $14 million and make cuts of $5 million. We knew it wouldn't pass, but we just needed to show people how dire conditions were, because people think you have reserves, everything's good. That's not how it goes. It's not how it goes. They said, oh, you got all this federal money. You got, it's easy, that's not how it goes. Federal money is called categorical funding. You can only spend it certain ways. Of course, if I could have spent the federal money any way I wanted, I would have paid off our debt, did a little less in facilities upgrades, and we would be dandy right now. But you can't, sp you can't spend federal money any way you want. There's, there's, in other words, there's conditions to that money. Um, next, next slide. So now I will call up Ms. Espinel, Ms. Espinel, let's come on. Yes, yes. Um, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to this town hall um, conversation. But um, I have some parents who have concern, and they keep asking me about the busing that's going to be in place come September, because it is rumored that they will not have any bus in for their kids and that's why they should not vote for the budget. So I would like that to be explained tonight because I know some of them were supposed to be here but the, I, I believe they're watching online. I want it to be cleared because I am asking them to vote for the budget and they're telling me they can't vote for the budget because they, they were told that there is gonna be no busing for their kids. Make it clear. So, I'll get that one. Thank you, Ms. There's, there's, there's going to be definitely going to be transportation. 
<laughs> Transportation for us is the biggest thing on the table. In fact, we, if there were ways we could modify it and go back to mileage limits, we would be super happy for that. But it would take the community to vote for that. And it's not just the private school community that benefits from universal transportation. Everybody does. Let's just suppose, let's just suppose we had a two mile limit in, in place. And I live the two miles. And you're one of my neighbors and you live across the street. And you're a little less than two miles. I get busing and you don't. They're not, people aren't gonna like that, whether you're public school or private school. I assure you, <laughs> transportation is definitely gonna be in place. And that's one of the reasons why passing a budget is so important. Not that the, the money we will get from a past budget will take care of all of our financial woes, but it'll start to heal. It'll start to bridge that gap between, or that divide between um, public and, and, and non-public school um, families. We're, we're, we're projected to spend 76 million on transportation. So if we're not getting transportation, I would have loved to know that. I would have, I would have known it already. But um, Ms. S, you can, you, Ms. Davis, you can let your community members, the community members you know, um, and I know they trust you, let them rest assured that there will, no, there will not be any issue with transportation. And, and oftentimes, there are things said just, cause, just to cause, my mother used to call it commess. My mother's from the West, from Vincent, St. Vincent. Commess is like confusion and mess at the same time. So it's like a patois they say it's commess, right? Some people are just out there, they're agents of chaos. We're not gonna have transportation? That's our biggest, our transportation is $76 million. You can't just cut off transportation without a community vote. Anyway, Ms. Espinal, jump in. I'm also thinking that there may be a misunderstanding with the fact that we haven't had local support for many years, which is impacting our ability to borrow, which Dr. Ellis spoke about in regards to our credit rating. So once we start obtaining greater support from the community, that will assist us in providing all the services, including transportation year after year. Do you have any other questions to make sure that's clear? No. Not yet, okay, thank you. Okay, this is a little smaller than what I thought it would look like, but on the revenue end, these are the categories of um, the revenue that we receive throughout the school year. On the top, you'll see the tax levy. The tax levy is being proposed at a 1.99% increase, which is approximately $3 million. Um, that'll bring the total tax levy for the school district at 157 million, 157.5 million. Um, so we, we, we're hoping that we're able to go out for the first vote, pass it, and not have to um, do what is often done year after year. We spend money on a, on a revote. So we, we don't want to think about that right now. Um, the, the second item is the New York State aid revenue. It's estimated at this time to be 14.7 million. Um, those are the larger items on the revenue that we receive and estimate for the next year. Um, there are um, other categories that, that comprise our revenue. Some of them are from renting out some of our facilities to the community. We have to um, charge for rent because the district doesn't take on those additional expenditures that the community will, you know, it'll help the district to charge. Those are use of facility fees. Um, on the bottom here, I wanted to highlight, we had a challenge with balancing the budget. And so we had many work sessions, budget work sessions with the board. And what that resulted in is use of our fund balance. Dr. Ellis mentioned that at the end of the school year, June 2023, we ended with a positive fund balance, which was approximately 18 million in unrestricted funds, and then we were able to create restricted buckets of um, funds, just like savings accounts for an individual, that um, are, you, are for, um, designated for specific purposes. So we have one that's a bucket of savings for our ERS expenditures. That's the district contribution for the state, for our employees that are not part of the instructional um, team like teachers, so that's custodians and other support staff. So this proposed budget is will have to will have to use 18 million of the savings, and an additional 1.7 million in the saving in the restricted savings. Does anyone have a question on revenue sources? No? 
So here we have the tax rate over six years. And it actually shows that the tax rate, highlighting the Ramapo, the Ramapo line, has decreased um, throughout the six years. It has gone from $119 per thousand dollars of assessed value to $115 per thousand dollars. And that's mostly due to the flat tax levy, not approving an increase in the tax revenue, as well as development in the East Rampo School District, around the East Rampo School District, causes the tax rate to actually decline because it's just like a pizza pie. If you have more, pe more people at the table, you're gonna get a smaller slice. Um, does anyone have a question on the tax rate history? And here, um, my office usually generates an estimate of what is likely to result as the tax rate for the community. Um, using, there's various factors that go into the calculation. So the, um, the item we change is actually the tax levy that's being put forth, which is the 157 million in the tax levy, the 1.99% increase. And so just looking at the town of Ramapo, if your house is valued at $500,000, the assessed value is estimated to be $42,500, and the change in the tax rate from last year, from this current year, well, last year, would be $2.30, which is approximately an increase in your tax bill of $8 per month, or I'm, the, I'm reading the fourth line from the bottom, or about $100 per year. You know, that would be the price you're paying to ensure that the children of our community are able to have a more robust um, instructional program. Any questions on this one? So what are the implications or the impact of passing the proposed budget? It's a better base because just like your money in the bank, it compounds. If you leave it there, you're gonna have a greater return year after year, month after month. Um, so it's a better base and it'll allow the district to start restoring programs and building instructional programs in future years. Um, we see what I have the blue bars at the bottom shows that if from here and for about four years out, we keep the tax levy the same, there's definitely no change. But if we increase 1.99% each year, that's that red or orange line, I can't, red line going up, um, the tax revenue increments each year. And before you know it, you've supported um, a better educational program for the children. And I, Dr. Ellis posed this question, but just think, how did we all get here, right? We had a solid foundation in our education you know, K through 12, and then we decided to what to do after. One of the things that this, this slide is, is super important. Um, Ms. Espel and her team did an analysis uh, last year as well. And over a five year period, if we had passed our budget, you know, the last five years, even at a minimal, the one, like a 1.9 or 1.0, our our baseline would be $30 million higher. Over 10 years, our baseline would be close to $110 million higher because of the, the, the compounding that she, she mentioned. But I know there are challenges with the state uh, foundation aid formula, but you know, the, the state and, and, and legislative policy, if you remember in science, like it moves at the speed of a glacier, like half an inch every 10 years. So if we're gonna wait on the state, we're gonna be waiting a long time. And I'm, it's not to put them down, it's because of the bureaucracy and it's so huge. Well, what I'm saying is if we all jump in, we'll, it'll be something that we really won't feel that much. Again, it'll be less than when you go home and clear the change out of your pocket, literally. And um, that's, I'm just trying, you gotta give examples of what it's like. Because if, if, when people see millions of dollars, they think, oh, I'm gonna be hit with millions of dollars. No, you won't, no, you won't, no, you won't. Go ahead, Nellie. So in percentages, the tax levy comprises 47% of our revenue, estimated revenue, and the state aid is 
The 6% um, is comprised of the use of our savings, which is significant. Um, when I had a conversation with the Moody's representative, I, I actually asked them, well, we have savings now. Um, why, why are we having this negative outlook? They said, well, what's leading and what's really driving the negative outlook is the lack of passing a tax, um, an increase in your tax levy. And the 2% is on other revenue categories. So I'll go over some of the expenditures and the larger driving, the larger items driving the budget to increase. Uh, salaries are estimated to increase approximately 21 million. This is due to contractual obligations. Um, so if we say we estimate those around 5%, every, many of our employees are um, unionized and have contracts that we have to honor, whether or not our budget passes. Uh, we also have um, designated some funds for hiring of all the staff and the specialists that we, knew, we need to um, service the different demographics of our district. Um, for benefits, benefits also increases um, proportionally pretty much to the uh, salaries. Uh, and we, we have a bucket for materials and equipment, um, contractual expenditures, which include um, contracts with companies to maintain our buildings, to plow the snow, plow the snow or um, mow the, the lawn, because if we don't have all the equipment, which is sometimes um, so it's something we cannot support under the years that we've had contingency budgets, we have to definitely contract with um, external um, service providers. Our transportation expense, as Dr. Ellis mentioned, is expected to increase to $76 million. Um, on average, when I look at the budget for other districts, this is the transportation expense is only five to 6% of their total budget. For East Ramapo, it's about 20%. Um, and then last year, we budgeted $6.3 million for the renovations of our gymnasiums and the ADA renovations at the high school. Um, this year, you'll see that this is blank. We couldn't budget anything for capital renovations um, besides what we're doing with the federal funding. And the transfer to special aid is comprised of 20% that the general fund budget has to support of special ed school, of summer school program. Well, Any questions on expenditure? I, I just wanna make a quick statement. Sure. One, one of the things that I've always been told coming up, that's why they say first impressions are important. Like, you know, when you meet somebody, don't, you never shake hands sitting down, you get up. You know, your parents did talk to you about first impressions, right? And perception, unfortunately, could be, could be considered reality, right? But the reality is, when you have a healthy school district, whether you have children in the school or not, right? I have older children, they're out of school. I have a little guy, he's in school. But whether you have children in school or not, if you, if you reside, if your property is in a district where it's a solid, healthy, flourishing school system, you feel more proud to live in that neighborhood, right? Because I, I think that's part of it. It also helps with improving property values, you know, little things that we know contribute to a healthy neighborhood. The first thing people think about when you go to buy a new house, the first thing, not how pretty the house is, how's the school system. Whether you have kids there or not, you know why? Because you know if there's a, a healthy school system, you know all the other services are gonna be impeccable, and you're gonna, you know, people are gonna be, they're gonna be pining to get to your neighborhood. And if you ever, ever have to say, I wanna sell, you'll get whatever you want. Because people will, because you know, going to a public school that's really high powered, you get almost a private school education, it's all including your property tax, why not? But I also know that all of you benefited from a quality education. Most people, most people in the United States, 98% of students, in, of, of people in the United States went through public schools. Many go to Catholic schools, but it's only 2%. Charter schools, only 2%. 98% of all of us went to public schools. And we didn't do so bad. But, we, but somebody financed those schools when we were young. Somebody financed those schools when maybe you were an immigrant. You were an immigrant coming to the country like my family was. Somebody helped finance the school. 
So that's what we're saying. That's what we're going to go through all these details. The devil's in the details. Yeah, but the other part is we want to explain to you why it's so important to pass this budget. Anyway, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. I went to public school in the city. <laughs> and CUNY. Um, so here on the percentages of the expenditures, as we see the salaries and benefits comprise 61% of the total expenditures expected for next year, and 23% is the transportation, which is pretty significant, Get reaching 25%, um, who knows, in the, next, in the following year. 16% um, is um, all other, which includes all those contractual expenditures that we expect to have. So I've been working with the transportation department to improve um, many, fa many facets. We have the installation of cameras through this company called Bus, Con Bus Patrol. Um, one of our vendors is fully equipped now. And so we're moving on based on the number of vehicles that each vendor has servicing us. We're kind of drawing down on the list to make sure that they have cameras on the, on the buses. The external cam cameras are required now that East Ramapo has signed a contract with the county. Internal, we signed up for the internal cameras, but those are optional for the vendor. Um, we have also been um, looking into upgrading the software for efficiencies. This includes um, how can we uh, process applications a little more efficiently. We have, you know, as Dr. Ellis mentioned, we service uh, over 30,000 private school students and uh, 10,000 public school students. So the private school community has to submit applications by April 1st each year so that they can receive transportation services for the following school year. Um, also looking to staff in the necessary um, positions it, within the transportation department, we're going to add an additional uh, route, safe, route safety inspector because we just have too many contractors that we have to verify that they're in compliance with, with um, every facet of transporting students, yes, and the regulations. Also, we're, we have our vacancy of the director of transportation, which is a very important position within the district. Um, and we're looking to reduce cost where possible. We have to, as a district, we have to follow municipal procurement law, which is bidding out the services and contracting with the lowest bidder. Um, this year, our challenges resulted in having to contract at higher cost because of the need. Uh, the bidding process, the prices were driven higher than normal, and so the lowest bidder still resulted in high prices for us. At the bottom end, which is hard to see here, that's the projection of enrollment on um, transportation services provided. We have the 10,400 for public school students. And then from 2022 school year to 20, I'm sorry, 2023 school year to 2024 school year, the private school enrollment for transportation services increased 4, student, by 4,000 students. Does anyone have a question thus far on transportation? Any additional questions on? Not yet? OK. Um, so this is the building condition survey that every district has to have performed by an architect every five years to assess the safety and the conditions of every building within the school district. Um, so here you see the buildings are listed out, starting with Spring Valley High School and the estimated cost to, um, to address all the infrastructure concerns per the architect's report. Um, in total, the cost is estimated to be $236 million. That's point in time cost, and that was performed last summer, this study. Um, so as we know, over time, the cost continues to increase. Um, so I expect if we're not able to um, have a plan and obtain a loan or funding for portions of this work or all of this work, over time that estimate is going to grow, um, increase quickly. Any questions on expenditures, buildings, conditions, and infrastructure? Oh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. So I am saying that um, what I saw in the schools and the improvement, okay. I know that work was done. Mm -hmm. And this, I am, I'm calling on the community. Um, this is a call to action to vote for the budget. And I can say, I'm asking residents of the East Ramapo Central School District to vote yes for the budget. I can say it. You don't have to say it. I'm a community person, right? right? So I am you know, here, and I really want to see uh, an improved East Ramapo. My daughter, I'm so proud of her. And she was a student there. And I am a proud mom. And I would like to encourage the community, the parents, to consider and to know that the budget begins with them. They need to know that their children need an education. And they need to know that the vote is for them to improve our community as well. And just like Dr. Ellis said, if you're living in a community and you, are in, you go out to another area, you want to feel comfortable talking about your school district. And if we all don't come together and stop doing the blame game, but go out and vote for the school budget, then we are not going to have a school district. Based on what you're explaining tonight and what Dr. Ellis is presenting, it is telling us that there is going to be serious concerns for our education system right here in, in, in East Ramapo. And we're asking parents to know they're voting for their children's education. And don't let people tell you that, you know, who is going to get this and who is going to get that. You're voting for your child education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Randy, we are all proud of you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for attending and still being involved. Um, and I hope college is going very well. Yes, great. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I would like to say there are, there are concerns, right? Um, as we express lack of local support or just passing, passing the, vote, the budget at a 0% increase is not going to change the credit rating. Passing it with an increase, just telling you how the Moody's rating um, operates, shows local support and shows a positive implication of Potential, the potential to pay off debt when we need to. Um, so that's why the rating will increase with local support. Um, so just to explain a little bit of what occurs when there's a failed budget, the district, the, the board can adopt a contingency budget, which means that the tax levy will be the same as the prior year, which means a 0% increase and reduced revenue in the amount of $3 million. Um, for if that were to happen for the next budget vote for the, you know, for the 24-25 school year, um, it's, the board will have the decision, but they can decide to use, to further use restricted funds, um, which does impact the fiscal solvency of the district and sustainability moving forward. They can also decide on reducing some of the expenditures. Does anyone have questions on contingency budgets? Yes, no. Sure. If it goes to a failed budget and it's a contingency budget, yeah. I, I, think, I don't think you can really court that. It would, be, it would be instead of $331 million, it will be two. Okay, thank you. This is for YouTube's sake. Um, it won't be $331 million, our budget. It will be 295 with, with, with any kind of past budget, successful budget, whether it's one, two, even if you pass at zero, we, our budget automatically will jump because it was an influx of additional funding from the state. Our budget would jump from 295 million to around 310 million 
And we made up the difference with our reserves because we had to you know, match our revenue with expenses. But if it's, a failed, if it's a failed budget, it sticks at 295, but our obligations are still 331. That means 331,000, you have to cut. If my math is right, that's $41 million. So you can use all the reserves you want. Eventually, it's gonna hit student programs, and this is what we're trying. We're trying our best to avoid and prevent hitting student programs. And, and, I, and I'll tell you, again, a, 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 a dist when you live in a, a residence in an area or neighborhood where you have a thriving school system, there's a lot, there's a couple of benefits. Number one, as a property owner, you have more real wealth, right? Because wealth doesn't mean you spend a lot. Wealth means you have access to a lot, right? You have more wealth. Second thing, it's safer. More, more well-educated children are, are, are less likely to do foolishness. They're less likely to have a need to commit crime because they, they, they can be gainfully employed. One more thing. I know you've heard this. The Social Security system has been really struggling for the last 40 years. We who work, we pay for the elderly that get Social Security now. And when we're elderly, the young folks will be paying for ours. So doesn't it make sense if they're more well-educated, they'll be better and more gainfully employed? You know, one generation takes care of the next. It's called a continuum of the cycle of life. And that's something that's super important as well. And I just wanted to mention that. We, we have what it takes to take care of it ourselves, But we have to avoid, as a, as a total community, getting into tribalistic behavior, meaning we'll stick with our own, whatever the, whatever the larger group says we'll do. If they don't want to pass budget, even if I know the right thing is to pass the budget, I'm not gonna stick with my group just because they say one thing. Sometimes, even if you're one person with an idea against 10 million, you have to stand your ground. If you, you have to do what's right. Anyway, go ahead now. So a contingency, just to give more information, a contingency budget restricts um, your spending. Um, it, you can only spend on contractual obligations. Um, you cannot spend on additional salaries or raises for anybody that's not in a union. Um, you cannot purchase equipment. You cannot spend on capital improvements. Um, so there's, there's a lot of restrictions and it's tough to manage in that, um, with that scenario. Any questions at this time? So our proposed balanced budget for the May 21st budget vote is $331,881,995. Expenditures um, equaling estimated revenues. So this here is the budget, the timeline of board budget actions. All the other dates have passed where we've had several work sessions with the board. Um, and so on the next um, budget meeting on 416, um, they will vote to adopt the budget that I just presented or, or not, um, but the, the vote is, is due on that date so we can move forward with all the legal requirements for um, establishing the vote, the voter information. Um, and then the budget vote is on May 21st. It's always on a Tuesday. Um, Dr. Ellis, is um, I guess going to complete here or Shanahan wanna take the <laughs> little shine here wow. thank you okay thank you yes so this is really is just a summary of everything that you've heard right so the academic social emotional learning and operations what we're trying to say is the school district is multi-dimensional it is what you see it's what the kids experience it's what we intend to do it's the academic outcomes and it's strong and healthy um, citizens that we're producing and if you take out your phone and um, and access this QR code you'll get a lot of information about the vote itself it'll take you right to the to a website where you can get information and register to vote if you haven't already or you can do that in the hallway right in the front I'll leave that up for a second okay okay um, 
So here you have some of the uh, important dates for running for the board. If anyone is interested in being a candidate to be a, a trustee, a board member, here are some of the important dates that you need to keep in mind. Right, um, Monday, April 22nd is the deadline to file a petition with the district clerk. And the vote for board members is also the same day, of course, as the vote for the budget itself. Okay, and as we close, are there any last questions or comments that anyone has for anyone who spoke or anyone from the, the district here? Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, Sharon McGill is right here, she joined us. Okay, so we appreciate your attendance and we are here, we're gonna linger a little bit if you have any questions that you'd like to speak with us um, individually about, um, we are here. Okay, thanks again. You really put me on the spot, but um, just, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see you all here and just know that um, the budget that was proposed wasn't easy. Um, we, we, they presented the budget. We didn't want to cut anything. Um, if we had the funds, we wouldn't have thought about, me personally, I can speak for myself, we wouldn't have thought about cutting anything at all. And I know the cabinet as well and the superintendent. It was hard. We did keep things that was good for the kids. So please, May 21st, I'm begging you, support our children. Please, we need your help. We can't sustain, even like Dr. Ellis stated a little while ago, there's no such thing as a contingency budget. We won't survive. Our buildings may be shut down. We don't want that to happen, especially for our children. They deserve better. I, I try not to compare our district to my district. By the way, I'm sorry, I'm an educator myself. I'm a math teacher for North Rockland High School. So I know what it takes to run a district. And can East Rumble Central School just get there? Absolutely, but it's gonna take our hard, hard, tireless effort, and we need the community with us and behind us for the sake of the children. I had two children that graduated from Spring Valley Senior High School. Even though I might not have children there in the district, the kids are still mine. So please, May 21st, let all everyone know in your communities to please support the budget. Please, thank you.